I V M. Have you ever wondered why women don't do more crime? Well, we're here to tell you. There's misconduct all the time. Women are thieves and murderers. That's gross misconduct. Con artists, money launderers. Mm, criminal misconduct. Financial fraud that's hard to track. Takes some planning, but still misconduct. Even breaching a contract. Well, that's more civil, though. It's misconduct. Misconduct. We tell you all about women that suck. Things that make you say, "What the?" It's misconduct. Hello, 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 and welcome to Misconduct. I am Raghavi, and I am Nisha. And today's special lady is Ruxana Sultana. She is a pompous Delhi socialite from the seventies who obviously did some terrible stuff. Yes, let's get into the terrible stuff. But before that, I want to sort of paint you a picture of what we are looking at in terms of who Ruxana was, where she lived, what the general vibe was like. Um, About the time that we're talking about, so imagine Nisha, hmm. or may I call you Ruxana? Oh, uh, you live in the 1970s among Delhi's political royalty. <laughs> uh, this is like the peak of Indira Gandhi's reign. Hmm. Uh, her son Sanjay Gandhi, uh, he's just sort of becoming, sort of coming into his own. He's having his uh, own little growth spurt, and hmm. you. Ruxana Sultana, you you're a socialite. Uh, you live this glamorous life in Lutian's Delhi, and you live this life of uh, parties, of champagne. Um, you wear silk sarees everywhere. Financially favorable alliances. It's just you're surrounded by just like affluence. Okay. Ooh, fancy! I'm so into it. It is very yeah. Okay. Um, it gets worse from now. Oh God. Uh, so one day, Sanjay Gandhi just walks into your life. Hmm. He becomes your friend. Okay, you guys are BFFs. You go on long drives together. Uh, you get ice cream in the middle of the night. You're having a great time. Just a wonderful time. Okay. And then one day, hmm. Sanju walks up to you and he says, "I need a favor." And you say, "Okay," because you're a people pleaser. <laughs> and uh, he gives you a very simple task. He says, "Figure out a way to get India's population problem under control." Wow. That's all. It's just this little, little tiny policy thing. That's all, okay. Except, he wants you to do this in the heart of Old Delhi. What do you mean by Old Delhi? So, Ruxana, Sanju says it'll play really well with the largely Muslim population of Old Delhi oh. if you are the one who goes to talk to them about family planning. Mm. So you go to Old Delhi. Mm. You round up all the men and women that you can find, and you tell them. You say. Population control is super important. Mm. You tell them get surgically sterilized, okay? But Ruxana, you have to get it done. You can't not get it done. Whatever it takes, whether they like it or not, whether they say, "Hey, I don't want to be sterilized," you still get it done. So, what do you do, Ruxana? I would do nothing. I would be <laughs> like, "Thank you for your friendship. Goodbye. I'm going home." Okay. <laughs> But uh, that's not what uh, Ruxana Begum decided to do. Ruxana Begum was what her name was when uh, she had to do all of these horrible tasks. But yeah, she rounded up about thirteen thousand men in Old Delhi. Vast majority of them were Muslim. She made them get vasectomies, and for those that said no, well, they were sterilized anyway. Uh, sterilization, by the way, and this is really serious, you guys. They are medical methods. Uh, sometimes they are surgical as well. They basically leave women or men uh, unable to reproduce. Uh, for men, very often these are vasectomies. Uh, for women, these are tubectomies. So it's a very quick surgery. Uh, I've heard it takes no more than twenty to thirty minutes. It's not particularly uh, all that invasive either. Uh, but the problem is, more often than not, they are not reversible. Hmm. So essentially, what you're saying is, hey, you can no longer have kids, and you cannot reverse this process either. So. What this essentially means is, if Ruxana got a bunch of people sterilized hmm. without their consent, she basically stripped them of their right and their ability to have children. It's terrifying. Yeah, but uh, on that terrifying note, <laughs> let's take a little break, uh, and on the other side, we'll find out more about India's population problem, uh, Indira Gandhi's shenanigans around this mm -hmm. time, 
uh, The Emergency, my personal favorite, and uh, Sanjay Gandhi's personal agenda is around this time. Just sort of context setting for everything. Um, and we'd also see how our lovely lady Ruxana fits into all of this. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IVM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession, and I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life-altering techniques, and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do, your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe, be well, be empowered. Welcome back from the break. So before we get into Ruxana and all of the terrible things she did, Raghavi, can you just take like a quick minute to let us know what was happening in the 70s and how did this environment come to be? Of course, Nisha, thank you so much for that. Uh, so the so 70s essentially was ridiculous political turmoil. Hmm. To put it very, very briefly, this is the time of the emergency. So what exactly happened is around uh, June 1975, Indira Gandhi supposed to have won the general elections, mm. except her opponent, Raj Narain, he took her to court. Uh, he claimed that she had used government funds and public servants to campaign for the election, all of which are essentially election malpractice. Um, the courts agreed. They said, yes, woman, what are you doing? They said, your election to the Lok Sabha is voided. Uh, they mm. said, girl, you are barred from running for public office for six years. They said it. They said, girl, yes. it's, it's, in, it's in the judgment. Sure. <laughs> the Supreme Court also approved this. Um, they said, yes, the Allahabad High Court is right. But what the Supreme Court also said was that she could be in power till the end of her term. Mm. This did not sit well with a lot of opposition parties. There were nationwide protests that were being called for her resignation, mm. uh, to which Indira Gandhi was like, oh, yeah, well, boom, take an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful way to handle this situation. <laughs> I mean, it's nothing unusual considering what we know about Indira Gandhi. Uh, but I actually don't know much about what it was like to live during the emergency. I've asked my parents and they were just like, I don't know, I was 15. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, same here. Even my parents have like no idea. My dad says that the buses and trains were running on time, but that's pretty much all he knows. <laughs> but of course, he, they were like deep down south in Madurai. So probably it wasn't as bad. Yeah, I suppose not. But then... Like, to essentially, to look at this from the lens of uh, just how bad it got after that, because uh, when we look at not just specific to the emergency, even before that, even after the mm. independence uh, movement and everything, uh, India focused a lot of its efforts on multiple things. There was welfare, there was improved mm. hygiene, uh, modern medicine, just a bunch of things that countries should just do for their citizens. Uh, okay. But what happened for India is that it led to this huge population boom. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying that there wasn't any poverty. In fact, the Congress government, one of their most famous slogans that they still use today is Garibi Hatao. Like it's just, mm. that's just what they say. Um, but it's, so it wasn't really a poverty situation, but people were just procreating like like crazy by this point. Yeah, our population basically went from like 250 million in the 1920s to a whopping 560 million by the 70s. That's more than double. That's insane. And Obviously, the government was concerned about this. But the thing is, you can't get rid of people that were already born. Unfortunately, you have to get them before they are born. So, I don't know. I mean, it just makes sense that you have to really make that effort to put uh, family planning in place, right? Mm -hmm. That's just that's just really important by this point. And India had a lot of very random, but really ineffective measures uh, that were sort of like grooming around. Uh, there was one of the health ministers had essentially just told women, you have to monitor your own safeties. Oh, wow. <laughs> you just have to do it. Like, essentially, I think we all know that monitoring your safeties to prevent pregnancy is incredibly, uh, like, untrustworthy. Please don't do it. Uh, they would also just distribute condoms and not tell you how to use it. Just take, take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And then all of this ties in with the fact that there was a lot of corruption around that time. Um, the allocated funds that were put together in all the five-year plans and stuff there was just no real benefit was we were seeing from those things. Yeah, so let's also quickly just get into the mind of Sanjay Gandhi around this time, now that we have all of this context. So at this time, Sanjay felt like he was the messiah that would solve the country's population problem. I have no idea where this confidence came from. I guess it just comes from the fact that he was a man. Aha, uh -huh. uh, that's it. I get it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> 
And this is all very beautifully covered in this book called The Sanjay Story from mm. Anand Bhavan to Amethi by Vinod Mehta, published in 1978. And I think a lot of our research and a lot of our information comes from this uh, book. Right. Because Sanjay had like zero knowledge or expertise and he decided to take up family planning as his chosen activity. And the magical cure that he devised for this was sterilization. Mm -hmm. Right. Now that is the solution. And since the emergency was already imposed, uh, like you had mentioned, and a ton of civil liberties were just suspended, it became very easy for the Gandhis to just implement whatever policies that they thought was, aha, this is necessary, mm -hmm. right? So looking at it from like a PR perspective, this means like, oh, we need a lot of good old-fashioned propaganda. Right. That's one way to do it. But then they took it like one step further and they were like, no, we will also withhold land, homes, rations, mm -hmm. money. And then even to another extreme, they went ahead and they were like beating citizens up. That's right. I think like it's also really important to remember that the entire phase of the emergency effectively became a police state. Um, yeah. Civil liberties were suspended. Uh, the, the press was censored to a great extent. There are loads mm -hmm. of cases that have come out of this. Um, and Indira Gandhi herself has had put in many, many policies that essentially made her almost like a, a queen of sorts, you know, with no sure, real democratic yeah. process at this point. Um, and that's really the overall like sort of context we're looking at here in terms of what the environment was like at the time. But why is Ruksana important to this story? Mm. Ruksana did play a very important role. She was initially sent out to convince women to get sterilized. Mm. And it made sense for them at the time because a lot of men didn't want to get sterilized because they were afraid. So they were worried that they would die on the operating table um, or that their wives would just leave them or, you know, become promiscuous or something. Sure. Um, they, I mean, and this is a very rational thing. They thought that their other organs would get affected and or they would have infections. All valid reasons. Absolutely. So yeah, Sanjay Gandhi, he could have made some effort to make the family planning set up sort of more education based. Mm -hmm. But who has the time for that? <laughs> I mean, we were country to run. So he just said he's going to give off the responsibility of family planning, uh, specifically in Delhi, mm. to a bunch of his very close aides. Mm. And one of them happened to be our lovely lady, Ruksana. Mm. Good for her. No, actually, no. Good for her. No, actually, this is actually, this ends really badly. Uh, so no, the thing is, I think like she is the perfect person to have done mm. Something like this. And I think maybe why don't you like, let's look into Ruxana's background a little bit more and we'll understand why. Yeah, let's look into a little more. Um, there's another book I read for this bit, actually. Uh, there are several books that cover the emergency and Sanjay Gandhi's time, but very few really focus on Ruxana herself. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is one book which is called uh, 24 Akbar Road, A Short History of the People Behind the Fall and the Rise of the Congress. This is by uh, Rashid Kidwai. It was published in 2011 sometime. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's sort of about all the major personalities that were involved, uh, Indian National Congress Party. And of course, Ruksana was one of them. So Ruksana was born as Meenu Bimbit. So she was born to Captain Mohan Bimbit, who was Hindu, mm. and Zarina Haq, who was a Muslim. So she had the best of both worlds growing up. Uh, they were it was a, she was a very, like, they were very affluent. Her family was ridiculously rich. Uh, she was also the niece of Begum Para, who is an actress who was very popular um, in the 50s and 60s. Hmm. And Ruksana has been, in all the pieces that we've read, apparently she's just a really beautiful woman. Like she was yep. just a gorgeous, stunning person. Um, and as a teenager in college, she had met General Shivendra Singh Vik. Hmm. And they married in 1934. And they went on to have a daughter together. Uh, General Singh, by the way, he's also very well connected. He is the nephew of the author Kushwan Singh. Hmm. Um which is where I first learned about how the birds and the bees work. Oh, God. Yeah, it's don't learn there. Learn it from your teachers. That's <laughs> that's just fair. Uh, but eventually the couple, uh, Ruksana and General Singh, they were not really compatible. They had very different interests and personalities. Mm. Um, and the marriage just sort of fizzled out after a point. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you mentioned Ruksana's daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just put a pin on that. That has to come up sometime later. <laughs> yes, it will. Mm. So, Ruksana, now freshly divorced at 31, she decides she wants to be like 30, floaty and thriving. <laughs> so, she started off a boutique in Connaught Circus in Delhi. Uh, 
Roxana was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. So obviously her shop sold high-end diamond jewelry. Of course, of course. <laughs> so it was around this time that she would meet Sanjay Gandhi. Uh, some reports say that she charmed Sanjay Gandhi quite early on and they bonded, they would get ice cream together and she would call him her ice cream buddy. Whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. I think it means they ate ice cream sometimes. Don't read that's too much into this, Nisha. <laughs> <a> terrible name. <laughs> No, within a year of meeting Sanju, uh, she started calling herself an activist and a social worker. So, and she was just constantly around him. Uh, so a lot of like Sanjay Gandhi's close family and aides didn't really like her too much. That like, Actually, many accounts say that nobody really liked her. Uh, Menaka Gandhi, who is Sanjay Gandhi's wife, found her annoying and said that Ruksana talks a lot of rubbish. <laughs> And this, there's one more which is particularly sad for me. Indra Gandhi once called her scatterbrained, which is so mean. You know, you know what? I was just thinking about this. Sorry, you know what's particularly sad about this bit? Mm. Um, is the fact that Indra Gandhi is not some normal mom who's just like meeting <laughs> your friend and she's like, oh, I don't like this girl. Indra Gandhi is the first female prime minister of India. Okay, and while being a prime minister, she has the other sexism stuff to also deal with. It's not like, True. she's just, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in her head. But she took the time out to meet Sanjay Gandhi's friends and be like, hey, this particular one, I don't like her. <laughs> so it kind of shows how particularly annoying Ruxana likely was. Yeah, but she was also like a determined social climber. Okay, so all of this, like, she was like, I don't care what you talk about me. I'm going to like persevere and, and make something out of this. Right. So Ruksana soon like unofficially appointed herself as Sanjay's liaison to the Muslim community of Delhi. This is probably the reason why everyone kind of tolerated her uh, because she had that kind of connect. And to help her with the transition into the community, she started going by the name Ruksana Begum. Right. And she frequented uh, Old Delhi. A lot. Oh, actually, let me... Um, so, Old Delhi, just for the folks that don't know it, or Purani Delhi, it sort of runs along the Yamuna River. Um, you would know it today as the area that covers these major landmarks like the Jama Masjid, uh, Red Fort, mm. Chandni Chok. Just a lot of the best places to eat are in Delhi. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially what Old Delhi is. It's just that whole area of Delhi. Yeah, and you know, I think this helps us kind of understand the stark difference between Ruksana's world and that of the people of Old Delhi. Because this girl, she was the one who was, I say girl, she's obviously a woman. Yes. <laughs> uh, she was like living in silks and diamonds. and But the people of Old Delhi probably never seen that sort of affluence, right? right and they right. couldn't understand it. But obviously, this didn't stop Ruksana from making some really, really bad PR missteps, I think. Ruksana would often frequent these areas in Old Delhi, especially around uh, Jama Masjid, as you mentioned, in mm -hmm. like bright silk saris, low cut blouses, just like dripping in diamonds and wearing giant round pink spectacles. I mean, the spectacles sound kind of cool now, but in the context, <laughs> yeah. in context, it just seems a little insensitive. Um, she would also carry like a kerchief with her, which was soaked in perfume because she doesn't want to deal with the smells of old Delhi. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll be very honest. Old smelly, oh, sorry, old old Delhi. <laughs> old smelly. <laughs> old Delhi just... does not smell amazing, but just smells of like a lot of amazing food and people. And it's just where a crowded space is, man. That's just all it really smells of. But what she smells of, she smells of elitism. That's yes, what this she is. Does. She does. I mean, I get it. I get that the Yamuna River was running there and all of that. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that brought in some smells. But this is ridiculous. I mean, there's one thing to be born into that sort of culture and like maybe want to maintain a certain decorum. I guess that's okay. But mm -hmm. it's a different kind of disgusting when you look down upon everyone else and actively demean them, right? That's Which right. is what she was all about. Yeah, actually, this I was going to do this a little later, but let's just kind of put this in together now. Mm -hmm. uh, this really reminds me of uh, the book that you mentioned earlier, The Sanjay Story. Mm -hmm. the, like I said, it had a lot of first-hand accounts of the author meeting Roxana and following the emergency and stuff. Mm -hmm. Then the author describes her in a very specific way. And I want to quote this part of it. Yeah. So Vinod Mehta calls Roxana. 
an engaging, articulate and intelligent woman who doesn't mind being in the news. She has a slightly 19th century attitude towards the lower classes, which is compounded of a genuine desire to help, a readiness to blame poor people for their own conditions and an inclination to serve the public by ordering them about. And that's perfect. I think that's the most apt description of Roxana. No one could have put it better. And obviously he would have that uh, kind of description to give about her because he's like hung out with her a bunch. That's true. And I think there's a great note to sort of start on how Roxana got into all of this. Yeah. Because um, it's high time. We've, we've done talking about, you know, her personality. We should really get into what she really did. Um, mm. The thing is, she just sort of walked up to Sanjay Gandhi one day and she said, what can I do for you? Which is when Sanjay Gandhi had said, you are a Muslim, go into the wall city. Wall city is what Purani Delhi was also known yeah. as. Yeah. So Ruxana's most important task to begin with was essentially to motivate this massive Muslim yeah. population of old Delhi to give in yeah. to sterilization. So Ruxana would go into parada houses and she would ask women um, how many children they had had and uh, if they would consider sterilization, what kind of sterilization they would consider, uh, those sorts of things. You know, it kind of gets me thinking about the kind of person that she is. Like, she's going by her name, Ruxana Begum, and we all know why. She's using her religion to manipulate these unsuspecting women. And, like, her Sanju gave her this task, and, and she's just willing to do it, whatever it takes, sink however low she must. And she just does it. That's a great point, but there's something else that I just realized. You consistently call him Sanju. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's really unsettling. This guy, at least just go with Sanjay. I don't know. What's... No, you said I'm Ruxana at the beginning of this episode and now I can't stop. <laughs> oh, oh, fine. That's my fault. Yes. Any case, Ruxana, let's talk about how you handled this situation. Oh God, no. So the thing is, all of the women uh, in the city had some very genuine questions for you, Ruxana. Um, mm. And what you ended up, well, that's just, in any case, what Ruxana ended up doing was, um, she didn't really listen to any of these people. So they would mm. ask her questions like, uh, would the operation hurt? How long would the whole thing take? Would it reverse itself? All, you know, questions you should ask your doctor, Fair, you know, so yeah. you can provide informed consent. But the thing is, Ruxana didn't know the answers to any of these questions. Um, Madam was a jewelry designer. She did. She had no, <laughs> she had no real experience in public health and sanitization. <laughs> so she, she didn't know the answers to these questions. Um, she didn't bring any material with her. She didn't even bring a nurse. Wow. Nothing. No, nobody. So the people didn't trust her. And mm. what started off as a campaign that could have just been like like a convincing, like an education mm. campaign didn't really work out because she didn't put in that effort. So the sterilization drive was a phenomenal failure, which is when Sanjay Gandhi was like, guys, we need to go in hard. We need mm. to we need to pick up sterilizations and we need to be forceful about it now. Yeah, so this is the point where we actually start to hear the stories of forceful sterilization. Uh, by June 1976, the states from UP all the way to Orissa were all like, knee-deep in sterilization camps. It even came to be known as the vasectomy belt. It was that bad. And on a single day in October 1976, um, around 9,500 sterilizations were recorded in just Gujarat. That's right. And the thing is, um, there's a lot here in terms of legalities and mm. it's really important to remember that and I'm going to say this very simply uh, this is not I don't want this to be considered controversial um, or anything but just remember that forcing a human being to undergo surgery to stop them from reproducing that's kind of very illegal is it though <laughs> it is it's not okay morally and also very not okay According to a lot of regulations including the <laughs> Indian Penal Code um, mm. in general harming someone in any manner without their consent. I mean, harming someone generally is terrible. Yeah. Um, to, be, to do that in, with the intention of sterilizing them, obviously, is another level of this. Uh, but it's not just a case of it being a criminal wrong. The fact is, mm. in, these, in this case, what we are talking about, the government was forcing people to do this. Mm. So what happened is that your constitutionally granted fundamental rights now come into play. Um, and as recent as 2016, because this is a problem that is still happening in 2016, uh, the Supreme mm. Court of India had held that the right to life and liberty uh, under Article 21 of the Constitution, it also applies to the exercising of reproductive rights, um, which means if a person is going to be sterilized, it can only happen with their informed consent mm. um, and it should be completely free of coercion. 
uh, again non controversial opinion the government cannot force you into it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but obviously ruksana and uh, all of sanjay's buddies took none of this into consideration this is also like a clear contrast between how all of the other aides of sanjay gandhi looked at the program versus how ruksana did it mm-hmm. most of sanjay gandhi's friends were a bit covert about what they did like they would issue circulars to schools and government institutions telling employees that their promotions would be affected if they had more than two kids right but ruksana herself was a bit more brazen about all of this she had power at this point <laughs> right and she was very very willing to use it um it was it, it became very obvious when you see her methods and the things that she did after that ruksana was also extremely delusional uh, i don't know if the power got into her head and and that's what happened but maybe she just was like a delusional girl who knows she ran like a b- half a dozen camps around jama masjid area one of them was called dojana house mm-hmm. uh, when questioned about this house saying that hey is this place really safe or what's going on there she she just dismissed that any wrong doing was happening here right Once when asked about it she even brought like a bunch of rejected sterilization applications and, and she said see i didn't ask everyone to get the <laughs> operations only those who want to do it only they are coming but if you take a look at any of those rejected applications they were just like of women who couldn't already like bear children or Why those who had hit menopause or something like that like oh thank you for not doing it to those people who anyway cannot have children that's really stupid like this person can't bear kids anyway but let's put them in our statistics exactly it's like <laughs> it's really terrible because the kind so the kind of stuff that she says really trivializes the kind of stuff that people actually went through because one of the other examples in the book that i had read um the sanjay story of course was about a woman who had lost her husband to tuberculosis mm. and this was because so they had taken him to the hospital but the hospital wouldn't admit him until he had a vasectomy because the hospital needed the numbers um by the way a lot of these hospitals were being essentially forced to do this mm. um there are loads of accounts we'll we'll give you guys some sources um in our substack and stuff but there are loads of accounts of doctors talking about how they were essentially forced into doing this nobody really wanted to mm. and they had to make an active effort to allow some of these people to just escape and this particular uh, guy this woman who had lost her husband uh he was not allowed to be admitted until he had a vasectomy he did eventually get sterilized because there's no other way he could have gone to the hospital but the sterilization left him so weak because he had tb yeah that he died it was just awful he it didn't matter that he eventually had to get sterilized because he just he just freaking died so yeah. that's the kind of stuff that is not really when we look at ruksana she doesn't believe those things were wrong because yeah you know what i mean that's that's the power and delusion that gets to you that's true and you know what let's that's is quite heavy let's just take a little break um and on the other side we'll maybe talk more about roxana's delusions uh and maybe we can talk about whether justice was served because that's the kind of stuff i like so let's see if that happens <laughs> hi everybody welcome to another great week on the ibm podcast network if you're not following us on social media please do we're ibm podcast on twitter facebook and instagram I'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Seat, Cred, and Global Victoria. We thank you so much for making all of this possible. So this week on Cider Says, Tapsi Pannu was recently featured in the Netflix original Haseen Dilruba was on. They discussed her experiences in Bollywood and a whole lot more. On Begin the Journey, Ashish Vidyarthi enlightens us with his wisdom on how one can get freedom from their own thoughts or insecurities when they communicate with others. On the Millennial Athlete, Tanvi and Shlok fill us in on all the drama from the world of sports with Wimbledon Euros and World Test Cricket making headlines every day. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav Mamoria kicks off a new series beneath the veneer. We travel to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan where he takes us through his first experience of encountering the Red Sea. We have a brand new show, Misconduct. It's a true crime show hosted by Raghvi, a lawyer, and Nisha, a PR pro. They tell us about the story of Cyanide Malika, the lady who offered cyanide-laden sweets to women and after they died, loot their gold. On the Global Victoria Tech Talks podcast, we showcase some compelling new tech stories coming out of Melbourne. On one episode, Pawan Srinath speaks to Joe Egan from Nelnet International, where they discuss how the pandemic has affected the edtech sector and its evolution. Another episode has Varun Dhirala talking to Ross Simons from Big End Studios about the gaming ecosystem and how they envision translating a sport to a game. And with that, let me get you back to your show. Welcome back to Ruksana Sultana's Delusions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um Let's actually there's a lot more to cover. Uh she was quite she's an interesting person. 
Uh, yeah. So the Vinod Mehta's book that he mentioned earlier, the Sanjay story, mm. it talks a lot about how Ruxana had accompanied him, as in he had accompanied Ruxana mm. uh, to the Jama Masjid, um, and essentially she had invited him to say, "Hey, I will prove to you that all the people in Delhi love me for what I'm doing okay. there." Yeah. So Vinod Mehta was like, "Okay, she's volunteering information. What a doof! Let's go." <laughs> And when they reached Old Delhi, she had a bunch of her henchmen sort of pull together some people and had them sit around Vinod Mehta, and she made them tell Mehta that she wasn't forcing anybody to do anything, and they oh. just sat there and said, "Ha ha, yeah, I mean we're fine." <laughs> okay. And there was another time. Uh, this is when so a series of riots had also broken out in Delhi because mm. of what was happening, and one of the riots had broken out in this area called Muzaffar Nagar, mm. and uh, Ruxana. to sort of calm people after this she brought two imams with her imams are essentially muslim priests uh, mm. they are these they are really revered sort of figures uh, mm. among certain muslim populations and uh, people take a lot of like advice and sort of you know uh, how to like read uh, holy books and stuff from them mm. and she brought these two imams and she declared to all the people there that these imams were being volunteering themselves to receive sterilizations oh wow yeah Let's just see. Yeah, just taking yeah, figureheads, you know. Yep, yep. It's manipulative. It is like I'm trying to think of the right word for it. Manipulative really is all it is. Yeah, that's exactly right. And also remember, all this while there were no real numbers that were coming out regarding deaths from the sterilization camps. Mm. So Vinod Mehta apparently said he had just heard of at least three hundred to five hundred people who had died at just Dojna House. Oh man. Um. and like i said there were there are thousands of accounts of people being snatched from their homes and their workplaces um even the fields on the side of the roads and just all forced to undergo operations but through all of this sanju and ruksana were the best of friends and she refused to hear anything against sanjay gandhi like this one time when she was quoted as saying this is ridiculous she literally said there is a huge slander campaign Oh. against me and sanjay they're just jealous of me <laughs> you can hear me flipping my hair yes as i, I say this cuz i know <laughs> she was flipping her hair and during all of this sanjay gandhi also maintained that the people weren't scared of the sterilization camps he said yeah we could have done things a little better we could have given some better after care um we could have removed stitches a little better etc but he never really accepted that the sterilization camps themselves were not working appropriately wow so uh- I would like to at this point highlight one truly despicable thing that we came across uh, this is the DDA incident mm-hmm. so in April 1976 the Delhi Development Authority or the DDA made plans to redevelop an area in old delhi called Turkman gate but apparently when the DDA bulldozer started rampaging some of the residents kind of went to Ruxana to ask for help and she just said well too bad i can't help you so then they literally got down on their knees they begged and pleaded and finally she responded with a trade she told them that okay all of the bulldozing will be stopped if they brought volunteers for the sterilization mm. right so this is proper coercion but of course people's homes are at stake so they agreed they agreed on 200 volunteers but getting 200 volunteers is not that easy right, right. So by the time the residents could get them together the dda had completely pulled down their homes There was obviously a huge riot that broke out. People were angry and they were out for blood. And Ruxana and Sanjay Gandhi were apparently stuck in an, a house in Old Delhi during this time, mm-hmm. and they escaped under burkas. Yeah, that's It's gross. Disgusting. It is. It is. <laughs> and I, I don't think she ever planned on helping any of these people. It's just some rubbish that she just said. Like, right. And through all of this, the worst part is that the government fully supported her through all of these disgusting things that she did. In the same month the Delhi administration issued a press release stating that Ruxana and the rest of Sanjay's study buddies mm-hmm. had been instrumental in completing around 15000 operations since the program started. Okay, that's definitely extremely underreported. Um <laughs> dude, what we're talking about right now barely scratches the surface of anything. I really invite you guys to read more about this because mm. um we do, like, it's really difficult like especially when Nisha and I were reading uh, for this episode, we were researching for this episode. So these stories was so fundamentally upsetting. Uh I remember it took me almost 2 weeks to really write this episode because I was just mm. it was just so jarring to read about some of this stuff, you know. It's there are so, so many undocumented accounts out there that we will mm. probably never mm. know about because they weren't interviewed or you know they died, you know, because of yeah. infection or something. 
Roxana is a person with like a black heart. Like I don't know. Even if I think of like the worst thing that I've done in my life, it doesn't even come marginally close. Like That's I don't right. know. What is the most terrible thing that you have done? Uh, okay, you just really put me on the spot. There. <laughs> We didn't discuss this beforehand. So just Nisha. in your life, <laughs> in my life, um, yeah, just the worst thing. I have used a Bangalore institution, okay, which is actually Blossoms. It's a bookstore. I have mm-hmm. used it in my favor to break up with one or three men. Three? Uh, <laughs> Why? Because I knew it'd be very quiet. It was. It was quiet. They couldn't make a scene. Um, so I have no. consistently used that. Listen, man, it happens. These things happen. I was a child. Um, what have you done, Nisha? This is not cool to ask me this. You know what? Uh, I feel like my thing will make you feel a little bit better. Um, I when one of my best friends asked me for the sixth book of Harry Potter, mm-hmm. as I handed it to her, I said Snape kills Dumbledore. What? I don't know why. I don't know why I did that. Like she, I was so. She hadn't read it before. She hadn't read it. <gasps> obviously, yeah. I know. It's just horrible. Bro, I know. So just like in between you breaking up with. Boys at Blossom versus Ruxana Sultana. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> no, you're closer to Ruxana. I'm really sorry. This is unforgivable. Hey. <laughs> This is disgusting. I can't believe I'm friends with you. Yuck. Oh, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> fine, 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 fine. Oh, anyway, still not as maybe. bad as the sterilization program. Yes, great. Thanks. Good segue. I was trying to figure out how to segue <laughs> back into this. But uh, yes, the sterilization program was pretty bad, guys. Uh, and the thing is, Ruxana, madam. Do we know if she had her day in court? Well, let's look at numbers first. Okay, mm. it's sort of estimated that between twenty fifth June nineteen seventy five, which is when the emergency started, and March nineteen seventy seven, about eleven million men and women were sterilized, and one million women had intrauterine devices that were inserted. That's a form of birth control. Mm. The thing is, we don't know how many of these were with consent. we will never know uh ruxana herself was responsible for 13000 of these vasectomies that were carried out in old delhi uh that's an official number <laughs> so just think about how much worse it could be and that's likely successful vasectomies we're not talking about like cases where people might have died or had infections and that's the thing we will never know how many of these surgeries were botched there are no official numbers surrounding this um outside of like independent journalists working on this sort of stuff we will never know how many of them died in pain or untreated infections and all these things um in fact there is a, a comparison that uh, an american journalist had done her name was mara hedendal uh this really stood out for me because she said it was reported that 6.2 million indian men were sterilized in a year which was 15 times the number of people sterilized by the nazis God, I don't think anyone ever wants to be compared to the Nazis. That's true. It's not the best in terms mm. of general comparisons, I would agree. But of course, it may not surprise you because this world is a cruel cruel place. Um it will not surprise you to hear that Ruxana was never taken to court for what she did. Of course, privilege. Privilege out of the butt is what this <laughs> is. Uh no one was held accountable for this. Uh not mm. Indira Gandhi. I mean she was held accountable for other things and uh, I use the word accountable mm. very loosely as well. Uh her baby boy Sanju <laughs> was not accountable for this. Um none of the other aides of Sanjay Gandhi mm. either definitely not Roxana. Instead Madam got paid. Wow. Yeah, so that book you mentioned earlier 24 Akbar Road it tells us that Roxana was paid a sum of 84000 rupees by the health ministry <sighs> for motivating Eighty thousand men to opt for vasectomies. Wow, motivating. Yes, that's a nice way of putting it across. I guess. And like you know, honestly, while we were reading all of this, this is stuff that I realized that has never been covered in our history books. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I think I feel like we had Mughal Empire, uh, British um, independence, Constitution, the end. That's it. That's India. all. Over. <laughs> We are now the best country in the world. Yeah, exactly. Nothing, nothing else needs to be covered. The only thing I know about the emergency is because, like, when I was studying for media, uh, I mean, I was doing my mass communications course. There were like a bunch of uh, newspapers that published blank uh, spaces as their editorials in protest, you know, because of the press oh. uh, restrictions. 
That's yeah, interesting. That's, that's pretty much, that's all I know. Yeah, that's actually all I know is because I studied law. Mm. Otherwise, I wouldn't know chunks of this either. In fact, I don't think, I think unless you have some sort of a background in constitutional law or you actively put some effort into really reading about this stuff, it's very unlikely you would know. So this is not something you would learn in school. Uh, it's just not something that will that you will ever come across, to be very honest. True. And yeah, and the thing is, uh, if you want to know where she is now, mm. We can tell you because we know exactly where she is. <laughs> uh, after the emergency, which was in 1977, a fresh general election was held to constitute the next Lok Sabha. Uh, and Indira Gandhi, of course, lost heavily in this election. Surprise. Because this, yeah, despite the world being a cruel, cruel irony, at the very least, we get these small little things peppered in <laughs> to make us feel a little bit happy. So obviously, among a bunch of other things, Indira Gandhi was blamed entirely for the sterilization agenda mm. not that she went to jail or anything she just no, lost the election and she came back later it's fine <laughs> just one term yeah then she came back and the thing is after Indira Gandhi initially fizzled out Ruxana just also sort of went away mm. um, Sanjay Gandhi also turned his back on her over time and Sanjay Gandhi would just go on to die in a freak accident in 1980 uh, involving his airplane and after that, Ruxana just sort of faded away from, like, the public eye. So, Raghavi, remember that time that you mentioned Ruxana's daughter? Mm, I do. Okay, so here's a little, like, uh, have you heard of the actress Amrita Singh? Mm, I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't feign surprise. We both researched this together. That's so, true. turns out, <laughs> her daughter... Ruxana Sultana's daughter is Amrita Singh. What? She oh, was sorry. this <laughs> Yeah, she was this extremely popular 80s Bollywood actress formerly married to uh, Saif Ali Khan mm-hmm. and mother to actress Sara Ali Khan and that uh, that other one that uh, Xerox copy of Saif Ali Khan. Of oh, Saif Ali Khan. <laughs> yeah, I I forgotten his name too. So, Ruxana was associated by marriage with the Patodi family as well. Ah. Ooh, social climbing. Even at this age. <laughs> it just never stops. <laughs> yeah. It just never stops. I agree. It's, it's a hustle, man. It's a constant hustle. Girl, you get it, girl. You get it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure she didn't uh, intend to force her child, Amrita Singh, no, no, into but... this marriage. But it worked. It worked for her. That's true. But there's some more gross stuff as well. So, uh, Sara Ali Khan posted a photo on Instagram for Mother's Day some time back. Okay. And this photo has her as a baby and she's in the arms of her grandmother, Ruxana Sultana. Mm-hmm. And her mother, Amrita Singh, is kind of like looking on at this beautiful image. So, the caption for the picture says, Meri ma ki ma, thank you for creating mommy. Hashtag happy Mother's Day. Which is so messed up because of what her grandmother was up to. Uh, okay, yeah, this is, um, this is really messed up. I want to drop an F-bomb here, but uh, I suppose we cannot. But there is a reason this is so fudged up. Just remember that it's really likely that almost 11 million Indians were forcefully sterilized during the emergency. Mm-hmm. Um, also remember that everybody was incentivized to get people sterilized. Hospitals, yeah. public servants, doctors, everyone. It was basically just, every, it was like a hustle to get people sterilized by this point. Mm. Um, Ruxana herself was responsible, as we heard earlier, for 13,000 of these vasectomies. Almost all of them on Muslim men. Like, she was not kidding around. And the thing is, it's not like India's gotten any better at handling all of this stuff, right? Literally, as of February 2020, mm. the Guardian uh, paper had reported that there were healthcare workers in Madhya Pradesh that were asked to convince at least one man each to get sterilized. Otherwise, they would lose their jobs. What? Yeah, it's like the, the order was eventually revoked. Okay, but at why why does that policy even exist? Why is it an incentive of any sort for other people to turn people in to get sterilized? Like, what the hell? Ridiculous. There's nothing to salvage here, okay? Mm. Ruxana, she had zero remorse for any of this. Yeah. Um, as there's also a collection of uh, Ruxana's old interviews that were put together by India Today. We'll send you a link of that in our Substack. Uh, she says there very clearly, she says, I personally think there were no excesses committed in New Delhi. Wow. Yeah. So this is a woman who forced thousands of people into getting sterilized, stripped away their ability to have children. So just keep that in mind as I read out Sarah Ali Khan, her granddaughter's, Social media caption to Ruxana. She says, thank you 
for creating mommy. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Man, it's just gross. It is. It is. Yeah. Anyway, we're at the end of the episode. Let's end on a cute C note. Uh as usual, we're going to do a little musical recap of whatever we've spoken about so far. Nisha, would you like to take us on this little journey, please? Let's do this. Just another swell day at my diamond boutique. A cutie with sideburns just wanted a peek. Started off as my ice cream buddy. 1975 things got bloody. They dismissed me as a scatterbrained fool. And the others said sterilization was incredibly cruel. It's almost like I just can't win. Sanjay, please tell them that they can't be so grim. Brought glamour to emergency. Bulldozers and fake priests, you say. I forced them all. Show me receipts. Just quietly go. And like my granddaughter's tweets. And that brings us to the end of this episode. This is a great song, Nisha. This is really, oh, thanks. Really well done. Solid, solid you quirk. I thoroughly enjoyed the irony of it all. I really put myself in Roxana's shoes, and I decided to sing. It really, really <laughs> shows, especially when you were like, I know you. I felt like you wanted to say Sanju, but you stuck with the word Sanjay. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> That was beautifully done. Uh, but yes, this brings us to the end of our episode. Um, We hope you enjoyed Thanks. listening to this as much as we enjoyed putting all this together. Yeah, and you can find all our sources and case files on our Substack, and uh, you can follow me on Instagram at just nishful thinking. That is at the rate just dot nishful dot thinking. And where can they find you, Ragavi? Yes, also on Instagram. I'm not any other. It's just my name is Ragi dot dosa. We'll link all of that into the uh, description of the whole thing. Um, that's it. Please follow us. Please go uh, check out the blog. Uh, you'll get a lot of additional information there about this episode, uh, the sources that we put together, stuff about um, like I I'd mentioned a series of interviews with Rukhsana. Those are really interesting because Madam is quite cuckoo in the head, and I think you'll have a great time reading that up. So yeah, and we'll see you again on the next episode of Miss Conduct. See you guys. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ Varun and me Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fans' point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us. Sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IBM app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts. We live in an age of disruption, of immense change in every aspect of work, life, and business. But is the old way of doing things truly dead? And are we ever going to stop saying the new normal? Join me, Varun Dugirala, on Advertising Is Dead every Tuesday as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders, creators, and change makers from across business, media, marketing, and beyond to dig a little deeper into how we got here, what we're doing now, and where we're headed. You can catch all the episodes of Advertising Is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Listener.